Hello everyone and welcome back to my lab. Today we are going to be taking a deep look at probing. And what I really want you to get out of this video is that probes are not ideal magic devices that take a signal from your device under test, losslessly transfer it to your oscilloscope without any modification. There is going to be distortion at every step of this process, both on the signal that's left on the device under test and on the signal seen by your scope. In order to illustrate this, I've prepared a little experiment. We've got a test fixture here with a 1.25 gigabit per second serial data sequence coming in over a multimode fiber, then out through a semi-rigid coax cable into this test fixture. It's a Teldon LaCroix PCF200, which then goes out through a second 50 ohm cable to the WaveRunner 8404M MS oscilloscope. So what we have is channel 2 with the signal coming off of the test fixture. This is the signal that the load on your device under test would be seeing. Then we have channel 3 connected to the probe we're evaluating. And then we have a memory trace which shows what the unmodified signal before we put the probe on there looked like. So as you can see right now, the probe is not on the board and channel 3 is flatlined, channel 2 and the memory look essentially identical. So this is to be expected, we haven't put a load on the board yet, so the signal should look the same as it did with no load. So the first probe we're going to be looking at is the stock probe that comes with the scope. In this case, it's a Teledon LaCroix PCP022. It's a standard 10 meg ohm RC divider probe, like I'm sure all of you have used at one point or another. We're going to begin using the alligator clip lead. This is probably the one everybody started out using. It's convenient, it can clip anywhere that you want, and it's honestly not that great. The signal is completely unrecognizable. You can't even tell the difference from one bit to the next. And this is because the long ground lead has significant inductance, and with high frequency signals, you can't see a thing. So it's nice to have, if you're looking at something really slow, RS-232, I2C, whatever, anything much faster, don't try to use it. At best, it'll confuse you with distortion in your signal that's not there, but you're not going to get what you're looking for. Next, we're going to remove the long ground, and we're going to put on the ground spring. This is the other one everybody's probably familiar with. So this is a little bit better. We can at least tell vaguely what the signal looks like. We can tell where bits begin and end. We obviously can't see any of the nuances of rise time, overshoot, or any of that. But this is a 500 megahertz probe. We're looking at 1.25 gigabit data. So this is honestly pretty good performance for it. What's not so good is what the signal on the device under test looks like. You can see channel 2 has these huge dips on all of the edges compared to the unmodified memory trace. So this is a significant distortion. You can see we've got probably 30 or 40 percent of the full amplitude of the signal is lost at times. So there's a very good chance that if you actually tried probing a fast signal with this probe, you would actually impair or completely cease functioning the device that you're looking at. So this is the main downside to the conventional passive divider probe. It does have high loading, and the bandwidth is not all that great. However, they are relatively inexpensive. Lower-end ones can have prices below $100. Higher-end ones are on the order of $200 to $400. The PP023 is on the $300 range. So now we're going to turn our attention to a different kind of passive probe, which has received much less attention than I feel it deserves. This is the transmission line probe, which consists of a, a length of 50 ohm line with a resistor at one end. And uh, if this resistor is, say, 450 ohms, it then forms a 10 to 1 voltage divider with a 50 ohm termination at the scope, and uh, this gives you a 10 to 1 probe. If you have a 950 ohm resistor, you then get a 20 to 1 probe. Conceptually, it's very simple. There are a lot of difficulties in getting the implementation to work right as far as parasitics and minimizing capacitance of the tips and so on. But at a fundamental level, 
it really is just a resistor at the end of a piece of coax. So the big advantage of this design is it's relatively inexpensive compared to other higher end types of probe because you don't have any fancy semiconductors, there's no active amplifiers. You don't need to be putting too much in the probe head. The primary disadvantage is you do have high loading at DC. You have, in this case, 500 ohms to ground from your probe head. So a transmission line probe would not be a good choice for looking at something like I squared C or anything with a pull-up that needs to hold it in a certain state between bursts of data and so on. But for moderately fast data, a transmission line probe can give you surprisingly good performance, even with a long ground lead. As you can see here, we're using the same long ground lead as we had with the capacitive divider probe, but the signal is at least vaguely recognizable. You can tell the ones from the zeros. It's not at all clear. The eye would probably be completely closed in this case, but for a lower speed signal, this would actually be pretty decent. So in the, say, high tens, low hundreds of megabits per second, you could probably get away with using this. So that's a big win for the transmission line probe as far as convenience, being able to use a long ground lead at much higher frequencies than you would otherwise be able to. And the reason for this is because transmission line probes typically have much lower input capacitance than a capacitive divider probe. With the PP022, for example, you have 10 picofarads of input capacitance. The TAO61, on the other hand, has 2 picofarads. So that's 5 times less capacitance, which translates directly to better performance with the same inductance on the ground lead. So what happens if we get rid of some of this L and switch to a spring ground? That's looking quite a bit better. There are still some distortions. You can see we do have some loading from the two picofarad input capacitance, and we also have some overshoot. If we take a look at the S21 curve of the TIO61, we'll see around 900 megahertz. There's a pretty good peak. This is a lower end transmission line probe. The better ones are much flatter. But on the other hand, this is a 1.5 gigahertz probe with a price tag comparable to a 500 megahertz capacitive divider probe. So for moderate speed signals, this may still be a good choice. Next, we're going to look at an active probe. This is the Teledyne LaCroix ZS1500. It's a 1.5 gigahertz active voltage probe, single-ended, with a 1 mega ohm input impedance at DC, and 0.9 picofarad input capacitance. So 900 femtofarads. As you can see, the ZS1500's frequency response is quite a bit flatter from the TIS61. There's no overshoot on the rising edges. We still do have some rounding on the peaks of the signals. This is to be expected given the bandwidth limitations of the probe, but the loading is significantly less. This is one of the hallmarks of an active probe. They do tend to have lower loading than uh, conventional passive probes or lower end transmission line probes. And at DC, nothing can beat the loading of an active probe. Looking at the S21 curve for the ZS1500 versus the TIO61, we can see that the large peak at 900 megahertz is not present. The primary disadvantage of active probes is their cost. The ZS1500 costs approximately $2,000, and the passive probes we've looked at so far are both around 300 The next probe we're going to look at is a high-end passive probe. It is a 6 gigahertz transmission line probe the Pico Connect 921. This is a 10 to 1 transmission line probe, just like the TIO61, but built with a much more refined design, costs about $1,000, and claims 6 GHz of bandwidth. In my testing, it seems to be a little bit less. It is still usable at 6 GHz, but it's below 3 dB of attenuation. So here we can see the waveform through the Pico Connect 921. The rising edges are nice and sharp. There's no overshoot we can see everything very clearly. So this is a really decent choice for high-speed signals, and this actually costs half as much as the 1.5 GHz Active Pro. So it's a significant increase in performance per dollar. And as you can see, the loading is the lowest of any of the passive probes we've looked at so far. There is, however, one limitation to be aware of. In this case, we're looking at a 20 to 1 transmission line probe. There is one important limitation to be aware of. You may be wondering why the signal is so small, and that's because this is a 20 to 1 probe, and we're looking at a fairly weak signal, only a few hundred millivolts peak to peak. And uh, many oscilloscopes, including the one that we're using, 
have limited front end bandwidth at high gains. So we can see our edges look nice and sharp right now that we're at 100 millivolts per division, which is actually 5 millivolts per division because of the 20 to 1 gain. However, if we adjust our vertical scale, everything gets all rounded off suddenly. So that's because we're hitting gain bandwidth product limitations on the oscilloscope's front end amplifier. So a higher attenuation transmission line probe, such as the Pico Connect 921, may not be a good choice for very weak high speed signals because uh, you may have difficulty getting enough gain in your front end to see them clearly. This is where high bandwidth active probes really come into play. Our last probe of the day is the Teledyne LaCroix D400A-AT. This is a 4 GHz active differential probe. So it's actually meant to be used uh, across a differential pair, but in this case we're using it in single-ended mode, connecting one input to ground and the other input to the signal. As you can see, the frequency response of the D400A is actually not all that flat. But this doesn't really matter because... Uh, these probes are calibrated at the factory with the response curve, and the scope software will actually de-embed the response of the amplifier from the measured signal. So we get a fairly flat response. It looks like it's not perfect. There is a bit of overshoot on some of the rising edges, so they might have boosted the high frequencies just a little bit too much. This may be just because the signal we're looking at contains significant frequency content past 4 GHz, which is the rated bandwidth of this probe. So it's possible the calibration only runs to 4 gigahertz, and stuff past there is being boosted a little bit too much. But overall, this is giving us a fairly decent view of our signal, and we can turn the gain up significantly more than we could with the high-frequency passive probe. The primary downside of an active differential probe is cost. I paid about $3,800 for this probe used. I don't really want to know what they cost new but I can imagine it's significantly higher, probably in the five to $10,000 range. However, they also have extremely low loading. In fact, the input impedance of the D400A is the highest of any of the probes in my lab. Thank you for watching, and I hope you learned something.